We have an Ostraker called the Arad Ostrakon from the time frame that we're speaking about. It's found in the Judahite fort of Arad in the Beersheba Valley. It mentions a group called Kitim. The scholars tell us that Kitim were probably all, the, 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 the word Kitim would be Greeks or Cyprites from Cyprus. Okay. This Ostrakon or these Ostrakon may refer to Greek mercenaries in Egyptian service guarding the vital trade routes that led to the coast. In this, one of the, in one of the Austrian is telling how much grain they should give to the Kitim, to the Greeks, the Greek mercenaries. So this will be a potential contact between Judahites and Greek Hoplite mercenaries. So this is one of the evidence that we have that these people came in contact. Also, Jeremiah tells us of a possible contact. He speaks about Judahites who lived in the Delta of the Nile they could also have been in close contact with Greek mercenaries and merchants who established trade colonies there. The word that came to Jeremiah concerning all the Judeans dwelling in the land of Egypt, those dwelling in Migdo, Tafanus, Nob, Pathros, we see that also in Jeremiah 46. So yes, the Judahites would have come in contact with these Greek hoplites. When we go back to Upper Egypt, from the 12th to the 10th century, that's the Philistines that the biblical text is ignorant about. Ramses mentions naval victories over a group named Peleset. He doesn't only name the Peleset, he says other invading people. And he says they simultaneously attacked Egypt by land and sea. It's important. So the group that came by sea, there is a group that also came by land. So Ramses tells us the Peleset and other invading people. They attacked Egypt simultaneously by land and sea. When we come to the great Harris Papyrus, it confirms what we are saying because the Papyrus reports that these defeated foes were settled in Egyptian strongholds. At that time, Egypt still dominated the southern coastal plain of Canaan. Exactly the place where the Bible locates the cities of the Philistines. Because of this data, because of this fact, it has been widely accepted by scholars that the Peleset and Philistines were the same group of warlike migrants who were settled by the Egyptians in their garrison cities 
along the southern Canaanite coast. There is no memory in the Bible of the upheaval that accompanied the arrival, nor in their connection with the late Bronze Egyptian administration in Canaan. It's not mentioned in the Bible anywhere. So the Bible is blindsided by this. I don't know about it. That is why I said we should distinguish the Philistines that we know of on the Egyptian walls in the Piparis from the Assyrians, we should distinguish them from the ones that the Bible talks about. The Bible knows them as eating pigs, but not all of them actually did. That's a later topic. Any questions, contributions till here so far about the Philistines, who I'm calling Greeks? So we put in them in the seventh century. That is where they make sense in the biblical text. That is where they make sense. They don't make sense. They're picked up painted about them don't make sense in the 10th century where we are told that David encountered them. They don't make sense when you put them in the, um, 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 in the Egyptian sources. So Rabbi, so I'll, yep. So I'm going to jump in here. So I'm um, just going back to that narrative. Um, one of the things that always that I always found interesting as I read that David and Goliath narrative because um, is that it said that Goliath said, send a man to fight, and if I win, you'll be our slaves, um, and if he wins, we'll be your slaves. Well, David won. And what happened? The slavery never occurred. Correct. So what happened? The Philistines just reneged on that deal, just like, oh, never mind, we were just running. So I just always found that that strange, that little narrative that they kind of put in there. Um, and I don't know if they were um they were really uh trying to um tie Gath and Jerusalem together because I think you had read um where the king of Aram went against Gath. And then immediately proceeded to go against Jerusalem rather than going against the other Philistine cities, sure. right? Which would have been which have, would have posed a more immediate threat. But if Gath and Jerusalem were strong allies, then that would make sense. First, you go after the you know the head, and then you go and take take the body out. So I just found that interesting. But you know. Um, and I, I believe also that Abraham had encounters with the Philistines too, but that's another anachronism. <laughs> Which we one? We, we, we won't leave that. We just won't leave that right there. <laughs> in seven century ones or the twelfth century ones, Mister Mark. <laughs> Look at my screen here. This is maybe to support why I lean to the Greek identity in Genesis ten. Even though there's, there's, a, there's a contradiction, the Bible contradicts itself. Um, in in the famous table of nations, which comes way later in the book of Genesis, it says that Mizraim begot Ludim and all these people, meaning that the Philistines are coming from Egyptians, right? Because Mizraim is, is Egypt. Uh, I don't even want to deal with that. You know, but we see Kaphthorines. The biblical text is telling us that they come from Kaphtor, which is associated with Crete, as Mr. Mark has um, mentioned in the, in the chat. The book of Amos also does the same. Where's my clicker? It says that, the, and also the Philistines from Kaphtor.
and is a geographical name usually associated with Crete. Jeremiah also mentions that. For you, Yudhavave will ravage the Philistines, the remnants from the islands of Kato. Great. Um, 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 Crete. That same great um, Harris Papyrus also tells us that the other groups of sea people who arrived with the Peleset, they were mentioned as Sikala and Shedani. So, uh, maybe this is their names. Maybe we are calling them Greeks because they came from the top. They came from that area. And in the seventh century, uh, we, we see, we see them going to their Greek sentiment. <laughs> Let me say that. The Bible talks about the lords of the Philistines. The Saranim or Siren, that is the lords of the Philistines. First Samuel 5, 8. And they sent and gathered all the laws of the Philistines unto them. 11. And they sent and gathered all the laws of the Philistines. And they said, send away the ark, blah, blah, blah. This is an unusual term. And it translates as rulers or lords. In Joshua 13, we, they, they, they mention the five lords, the five serenades. What we know about this word is that the term does not have a Semitic derivation. And therefore, scholars presume this to have been a Philistine word that was adopted into Hebrew. The word is not Semitic. No. The scholarship leans to the side that it is Philistine. Um, uh, it's a Philistine word that was adopted into Hebrew. Here, it refers to a league of five Philistine cities, what we call a pentapolis. Scholars have usually connected the, um, 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 they've, they've connected it etymologically with the Greek word terrinos which means tyrant. It's interesting that this makes its first appearance. The Tyrannus makes its first appearance in the 7th century BCE. The same time frame that we're speaking about. The first ruler to be referred to as a tyrant in Greek literature, we are told, according to the Assyrian text, sent mercenaries to Egypt. I don't know how to pronounce his name, but he was king of Lydai, Lydia. So yes, we have the five lords of the Philistines. Now, by the 7th century BCE, they had already become a widespread phenomenon in Greece and Western Asia Minor. When I make that statement that by the 7th century, these five lords, this pentapolis, by the 7th century, they become widespread, it means that they were not. Because this manner of organization is not typical in the Asian Near East. We have this League of Nations. No, but they are fairly common in the Aegean world, beginning from 700 to 480 BCE. So 
So when we see the five lords, we can actually date it to when that um, um, organization, that type of organization um, became well um, widespread. Seventh century. We're painting a picture. So now, with everything that we've gathered about the Philistines, the early ones, the Philistines, the ones that the Bible talks about, where they may possibly come from, how they may have looked, how that may have changed, the economical and political background in the time of Josiah and when the Assyrians were leaving, and when Smaticus the first was taken, was, was filling the vacuum. With all of that data, what message did the Deuteronomistic historian try to convey by dressing Goliath as a Greek hoplite? and telling the story in a Homeric genre, in a Greek genre, if I would say. Why the story of David and Goliath? Number one, knowing that it was Elkanah, who actually killed Goliath, not David. Why do you take that episode and let David take credit for it? Why, my question, convey this, how they conveyed it, with Goliath dressed as a Greek hoplite and then telling the story from, let's say, a Greek genre or a genre from Homer. Why is that? As we started the class, Josiah came to the throne as an eight-year-old boy in 639 BCE. Assyria was still at the height of its power. The Assyrian Empire was fast collapsing by 630 BCE. and they begin to withdraw. This withdrawal created a vacuum, a power vacuum. Egypt under Semiticus I emerged as a serious successor. And what does he do? He annexed the trading cities of the Philistine plain. As I mentioned at the beginning of the class, it's during this time that Josiah was doing his reforms. Even though these events are described in the Bible as purely religious actions, they were more political. With the Assyrian family um, in control of the Northern Highlands, there was no possibility for Judah of claiming rule over the remaining Israelite population. No chance. Because as long as Assyria remained dominant in the region, Judah's political independence and freedom of action was severely limited. So as the Assyrians withdrew, the kingdom of Judah took advantage of the new conditions by expanding a little bit north we hear about the shrines at Bethel that got destroyed 
and then they came a little bit west to the upper Shefila. They couldn't go to the lower Shefila, but the upper Shefila, which had rich farmlands. And I stated that any hope of reasserting Judahite control of the lower Shefila risked military confrontation with Egypt, who was the emerging superpower. But in the late 7th century BCE, what we see is two great rival dreams collide. What are the dreams? Number one is Judah's fantasy to reestablish. I have reestablish in parentheses because you can only do a re if there ever was, and there, there never was a united monarchy. But just to pass the idea across, number one, the, the dreams that were colliding. Number one is Judah's fantasy to reestablish the united monarchy of David and Solomon, and then Egypt's vision of reviving its ancient empire in Asia, because um, it was at the time of some Semiticus the first that Egypt was trying to, you know, gain that superpower status or regain that superpower status that it previously had. But Judah's dream of recapturing the rich lands of the Western Shefila was threatened by the power of Egypt that now dominated large parts of the Philistine plain. So now what do we have portrayed by the Deuteronomistic writer? We have a duel between David and Goliath, who is dressed as one of the Greek hoplite missionaries, um, mercenaries, sorry, who protected Egypt's interests and might. So what you see in the David and Goliath story they actually symbols. They symbolized the rising tensions between Josiah's Judah and Egypt in the 26th dynasty. When you see Goliath, you're not looking at Philistines, you're looking at the Philistines or the Greeks that represented Egypt. When you look at David, you are looking at Josiah's ambitions. These two dreams are colliding. This is what has happened historically there. So to the Judahites of that era, with the awareness of the threatening Greek presence, the implications of the story were clear and simple. The new David, Josiah, would defeat the elite Greek troops of the Egyptian army, Smaticus I, in the same way that his famous ancestor, overcame the mighty, seemingly invisible Goliath. So you have history on the stage in David and Goliath, a Homeric epic at its best. The Philistines, in closing, 
are a people who came from the Egan world in the 12th to the 11th or 10th century. Over time, they settled in the southwestern coastal plain. We see archaeologically that they have their unique material culture, but they assimilate more and more over time. They even started to use the local language over time. They did. We see it in their names like Goliath, Ikasu, who is Ahish. But they are retaining their Greek ancestry. After five centuries, I believe they return to their roots or to their sentiments. That is why they begin to look like where they come from, the Greeks. Because they did not look like them when they came on this stage in the 12th, but in the 7th, they looked like the Greeks that we have come to know as the Greeks. They assimilate, they kept their names. Five centuries later, we see them return to their roots or to their sentiments. And this is all happening because Assyria is collapsing. There is a power vacuum. Semiticus the first comes and fills it. Judah misses the opportunity to actually take over this Shephila completely. They cannot go up north that much because there are issues there as well. And the Deuteronomistic writer captures what is happening historically puts it in the figure of David and Goliath. And the message is that just as one time, a Judean from Bethlehem named Elhanah was able to destroy someone called David, a Greek hoplite, which I agree or I subscribe that was a historical account, Elhanah, Elhanah's duel with Goliath, they take that legend, give it to the founder of the dynasty, David. And now they apply that to the new David, who was Josiah. This is what is going on. This is what we know about the Philistines. There's a lot more to say about them because David had them as his in his army they're called the i forgot their names but they're not called philistines but david also had them as their army telling you their status when it came to the battlefield or when it came to war 